I'm just going to get the screen up. So um, there's quite a lot in these slides. The idea is I'm just going to take you through them and give you an overview. But obviously, if you'd like the slides, um, Jess is very happy for you to contact her or feel free to contact me and I can send you a copy of these. So, um, yeah, so basically today I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of whether you're looking for investment, whether you're scaling your business or whether you're thinking in the future of moving it forward in different realms. So, yeah, I help a lot of people, whether they're starting up and they've got a concept and they move through, whether they're looking for seed investment, VC investment or mergers and acquisitions. So I take people through the entire journey. So whether you've got a concept that you want to start, whether you've got a product and you're generating income and you want to scale, whatever stage you're at, I've kind of tailored this presentation for everything. So some of it will apply, some of it won't. So going forward, what's the most important thing if you're looking for investment, but also if you're scaling, is to get your house in order. As you'll probably know, if you've ever gone to buy a house or buy a car, if you see one thing that you don't like, it puts you off and it concerns you and you start drilling down more. So the more you present yourself in a transparent, concise and orderly manner, then obviously the more impressionable you are to the investor that you are worth going down the, the whole route. So first of all, you know, have you looked at all the other options? So not just friends and family money, but R&D, um, any grants that are available, any tax structures. You know, ha have you actually got money in to actually encourage other people to show that there is already funding there and there's already people involved? And have you understood who the partners are? So sometimes if you're just a sole trader, you're worried that you get the money and people won't think you've got the requisite skills to run everything. Well, not everybody does. You can't always be perfect in every sector. So again, don't think you have to hire people or they have to be founders. Put in your team, any doctors that are willing to do trials or any friends and family that are actually trialing your product. Or maybe people that are offering you free support and advice that are happy to go on the panel to actually show you that you've got that experience and skills within the group. Review your structure to make sure that company's house, your shareholders agreements, your documents, your tax structure, your business plan, they're all aligned and all together. Sometimes there's red flags that you haven't calculated something wrong, that the term sheet doesn't mirror, the filings haven't been done right. Just be careful they're all aligned. And if there's any problems after that audit, resolve them. Be honest with the investor, move forward. Um, a lot of people discuss NDAs because they're very important for patents and a lot of time investors may not want to sign them. So give them enough information to tease them, get them interested. Then when you're comfortable, ask them to sign an NDA to protect it. If you have a patent pending, however, make sure you do put an NDA in place to protect it. Some brokers will actually want to go out there and help you. And if you choose to go around that route, be careful you don't sound into exclusivity. Be open to other avenues. If they do ask for exclusivity, understand what that looks like. And make sure you understand what a term sheet is, that everything's correct, that it's all aligned and mirrored again, because they will drill down and test you on that. Very important that the founders are all in agreement. Make sure that you understand how much control you're going to give, that you know what you're going to be asking for. Have the difficult conversations before you go in front of the investor. Obviously, you don't want to have arguments at the time of the investors pitching or later if they're showing interest. You're going to have to be ready for the tough questions. You're going to have to be transparent. The more prepared you are, the more concise you are, the more likely you are to get that over the line. GDPR, you're going to make warranties that you have no claims, that you've done everything right for GDR purposes. So just make sure you understand your responsibilities, that you have the basic policies, and that you understand what's going through the whole process at the moment. And then you're going to have to have a look in the mirror. So do you have a clear exit plan for their money? and for when they leave and how you're going to move forward. Have you got a clear plan how you're going to spend that money and the impact it's going to have on the business? Not only are you going to have to have that for your business plan and pitch deck, but to actually put that into action when they give you the money. And then you're going to have to understand your market. Where are you going to go with this? Is it outside of Europe? Is it inside Europe? What's your competition? How are you going to beat the market? All of this needs to be fed very carefully into your business plan, mirrored into your legal documentation. And then you're going to have to put the infrastructure in place, the technology, you're outsourcing it. Or are you keeping the IP in-house? Have you got the legal support to make sure that IP cannot be run away with, that people can't hold it to ransom if you haven't paid their bills, that it's yours? That's so important. And again, an investor is going to be really excited if you've got the technologies ready and available. If you're a technology business, they'll want to see that you have the resources, that you have the people available, that they've got robust contracts. Therefore, you're really tied down company. Your goals have to be achievable to convince an investor, but also you as partners. 
you have to be aligned, but also for you. What do you want out of this? Don't forget to put your salaries in the business plan because you can't work for free for, for years and years and years. And I do find a lot of my clients forget that. So when they're scale-up plans or the investment plans, you've put everything down about marketing, about launching the product, the development. Don't forget about you as founders. How do you survive? How do you make your money? Make sure it's achievable and make sure it's fair um, and make sure that's all counted for. And you have to have cash flow planning. So while you're spending six months scaling up or six months looking for investment, and then you're going to have to deal with the infrastructure, who's dealing with the business? Who's dealing inside with the development of the product? It's a hard job to do everything. So you're applying for grants, you're going for investment, you're scaling up, you're hiring staff, you're putting the infrastructure. Don't drop the ball on the actual business and development itself. Do you need to hire people? Do you need to ask for more support? An investor will want to know you can handle it and it needs to be put in the business plan. But for you, have plan B. What if you don't get all the investment? What if something goes wrong? What if the client doesn't pay you on time? In your own mind, if you have a structure, you have a plan and you have contingency plans, it will really help you move forward and scale up and keep on track. And as we all know, it never goes to plan. There's always different good and bad. So, but having a guide and a plan going forward to start with will really, really help you. And then you have to look at the partner. So whether you've got a co-founder now, whether you're bringing in an investor, whether you're asking people to come on your team, do they really understand you, your business and your goals? Have you had those really tough conversations? Because you need to do that whilst the company's at its early stages potentially why it's not worth anything but it will be as soon as you start getting extremely busy you're scaling you get investment difficult conversations are harder to have so you need to make sure that your goals are aligned you understand who's responsible for what when you have authority to act on your own or when you need their approval what if one of them wants to leave have you got provisions in place in your mind for that can they retain their shareholding but what if they go and set up in competition it's really good to have bad lever and good lever provisions and see yourself as founders as an employee, because if somebody wants to leave, protect the business and yourself. But obviously you can support and you can look after each other and you can have good provisions, but you just have to be careful who owns the IP, the continuation of the business, that you've got mechanisms for how that works. Sadly, somebody could also pass away or have a divorce. So again, look at different provisions like who would be the beneficiary? Do you want them to come in and manage the business? Or do you want what's called cross-option insurance, which means if sadly one of the founders or investors passes away, the beneficiary is paid by insurance, the shares are given back to the company. Potentially, if somebody wants to leave and it's a good lever, you don't want them to be out of pocket. So they have to have buyback provisions where you buy back their shares, they don't return shares, but potentially the company can't afford it right now. So maybe you do it over a period of five years. Maybe you only do it when an investor comes in or upon sale. Having these conversations now, it gives you a really nice platform to build your relationship, know what's going on and when, but it gives you a mechanism if something goes wrong. And it goes without saying you are directors of the business, potentially making decisions on a daily basis. But at what level do you want to have other people involved? When do you need shareholders consent? When do you need everybody to agree? And when it's a majority? Now, this will all be documented in shareholders agreement, and this is key. So you can sign a contract, say up to £5,000, but beyond that, you get people's control, um, sorry, consent. Perhaps one of you is the day-to-day -day and one of you is marketing or development. And when do you make decisions with or without that person? It is really good to have those conversations very early on, document them in the shareholders agreement, and that gives you both the guidance. And, you know, if mistakes happen, you talk about it. If something fundamentally breaks down, that document will help you guide through the resolution. And ultimately, if it doesn't work, the parting of waves. So we also need to make sure that as cash flow increases, as you scale up, as you get investment, you're not crippled by cash flow. Cash flow is the biggest thing that every business faces. Now, when you first start out, you want as many clients as possible. You're off the discounts. You might have nothing for three years. You have to be very careful you don't overextend your business and yourself and that all the documents are aligned. So make sure that you have a very robust contract. It's very clear on cancellation terms. It's very clear on payment terms. Um, and it's mirrored in the invoices and it's mirrored in your website terms and conditions and it's mirrored in the way you act. The difficulty is if you overextend or you extend credit to one client or you procrastinate on chasing people, very quickly cash flow can catch up with you. Sometimes invoices will say payment terms of 30 days, 
but your contract may say certain trigger points or 10 days. Maybe a client's got in the habit of paying you quarterly, even though you said monthly. You need to have a very clear process when you need the money, and that should be reflected on all the documents. And when you are running your business and you're scaling, it's very hard to keep up with it. So processes really do help you document them, train all your staff if you do have them to try and keep on that. And it's really difficult when I started out, you know, I was like, oh, I want this client, I'll give them a discount. Oh, they can't pay this month, I'll give them next month. The problem is the more you discount to clients, the more you extend credit, the difficulty is for you to then service other people. So again, if you have a process and you have a strategy and you have a system, it's harder for you to come out of it. It's harder for you to then feel guilty to certain clients and it really will help your business. And if it gets so bad, unfortunately, you are going to have to add interest, potentially incur legal costs and don't delay. Write to them with credit control, write to them and push forward. You have the right to be paid and just don't procrastinate and deal with that. And that just means, again, clear terms throughout. You are going to have to forecast. So a lot of if technology companies, for example, will have a contract with a large um, organization and there'll be certain milestones. If you get to stage one, we'll pay you this. If you get to stage two, we'll pay you that. Invariably, there's going to be problems potentially with the code or maybe a staff member's gone off that was needed. And that pushes the stages over a week or two. What's your contingency plan? If that client's not going to pay you on the 1st of October and it won't be until the end of November, how do you sustain your costs? Who pays your bills? What's the plan? You really do need to have that in place. I've had companies, unfortunately, really struggle because such are the large organizations are very robust on that. They will not pay you till you've hit that milestone. You can try and negotiate on the contracts. Very difficult if you've got procurement documents with large companies. So again, you're going to have to really think about that and prepare for that. Can you sustain that contract? Can you risk entering into that contract? And if you can, you've got your forecast, you've got your plan, and then you've got your backup plan. Having a strong financial grip is really difficult if that's not your forte or you're running a business. And not everyone can afford to bring in-house accounts. We totally appreciate that. Perhaps you need to get a part-time FD and outsource it. It depends on your strengths and weaknesses, but sometimes I say to people, spending a little money on outsourcing to an FD might help you, but that obviously is something you'd have to decide upon. But as you get money in and start scaling, that becomes absolutely essential. At the moment, recruitment is very difficult. Retaining technology um, and you know real talent is difficult. So how do you prove to an investor or how do you satisfy yourself that you're able to scale? You have to choose, you bring people in, in which case you train them and you have to embrace them and retain them. Do you outsource? Do you go to larger companies? Do you go abroad, which is a big thing at the moment. The most important thing is you think about your options. So at the moment, there's talk that the IR35 rules will go away, which means people can be self-employed and work for you without the risk of becoming de facto employees and end up succumbing to income tax. This means that somebody can work for two or three businesses or work for you on a fixed term basis without you giving them all their employment rights and all the deductions, which gives you higher levels of pay and talent. Obviously you can give them pensions and other benefits and bonuses if you wanna bring them in on baseline salary, so you can't give them the immediate salary straight away. The other thing that a lot of people are doing is options um, and EMI schemes. So if you can't afford to pay them the 100,000 pounds they're worth immediately, you pay them a base salary you give them shares in the business so as the business scales and potentially you get investment and exit, they're with you, their goals are aligned with you. And you either give them the options, but if they leave, you take it back. You give them the options now and then cash them in when you exit. So there's a lot of creative ways you can actually incentivize staff to come on board and stay without it all being pure hardcore cash. You can have subcontractors, you can outsource, as I've said, you just have to be really, really careful that you have a good contract with them. You don't want them holding, say, intellectual property to ransom until you pay. You don't want them retaining your confidential information. So whether they're outsourced of contractors, consultants and employees, you have to have robust contracts. Restrictive covenants, they can't work competitors, don't set up on their own. They can't use your trade secrets. They can't breach confidentiality. The IP belongs to you. GDPR. The sharing of information is all regulated and controlled between you. You've got certain caveats in there, how they must act, how they must comply, and what they must do for you. 
And then obviously you've got your notice period. Do you want to be able to get rid of them within a week or do you need to retain them for three months? You need to think carefully. Very often you put them on a probation period for, and then you can both leave within a week if it's not working. And then after that, when you know they're performing well and you know they're good for you, then they're tied to you for longer. And again, there's many things that you can do with this. Touching on EMI, which is something a lot of people are doing at the moment where they come in at base salaries or even free and they're getting shares in the company. Now, you can give them shares and take them back. That's called reverse option. You can give them options now, which has some tax triggers, and then they get their payment for their shares when they sell them on exit. Or you can do what's called an EMI, which is a government regulated registered scheme. It does cost a bit of money to set up, but in the long run, you are going to do this for volume staff and you are going to keep people on board long term. It's going to be a really tax efficient method for both of you. You set all the parameters, what shares they have, when they have it, when they forfeit, when they're eligible. You're in complete control of that. However, it actually reduces the tax both you as a company and the employee pay. And the benefit is that they own the business with you. So it's in their interest to grow that business with you, to keep everybody happy. And it's harder to leave a business when you're a shareholder and you've got a benefit than it is just to give up a salary and get something else where... So again, this is something more and more people are using. But as I, you can see here, you are completely in the driving seat how that works. As people grow, you've developed your intellectual property, your trade name, your brand, your logo. And it's been about you as the founders and the team. That's how you've scaled, you've sweated blood, you've got your investment. But if you want to sell the business later, you want to get larger VCs in, it has to be about the brand and the business, not you as a founder per se. So you need to now, A, protect your intellectual property, but make that intellectual property sell itself. So it should be about not Karen Holden. It should be about a city law firm. Who's that brand? They're the people that we go to. You need to make sure that, as I've said constantly, that all IP has been assigned to you. So if a founder has developed it, you need in writing to pass that to the company. If you've outsourced the design of anything, make sure the contract passes it to the company. If you have staff working for you, make sure it's in the contract that it's owned by the company. IP only transfers in writing still at this moment. And that's what an investor will be looking for. That's the goodwill and your value of your company. And we're not just talking code, we're talking your name, we're talking your colours, we're talking your logo, we're talking perhaps designs. Make sure everything is held firmly within the company. And also check, you know, if you're going to go to Europe, is it available in Europe? It's great having a, a massive UK goodwill and name here. But if you can't go to the jurisdiction you're later intending to do so because the name is not available, then you're going to have to think, do you change your brand here or do you have a new brand there? Do your due diligence early into the jurisdictions and sectors that you want to go into? A lot of people set up originally a trademark for, say, catering, but then they want to develop into online sales. And then that name may not be available. So if, again, when you're starting to scale, think laterally, where would we go? What would we be doing? Are there any bolt-on services? Can we protect that now and expand in the future, but consolidate that now? And that's not just trademarks here, but also your intellectual property, your design rights. You know, protecting it with NDAs is one thing, registering your trademarks another, making sure all your contracts are robust, making sure your clients are robust. And also it's really important that if you have a contract with somebody that protects your IP and what you're doing now, if you then later change that and do something slightly different, don't forget that's not protecting that IP because that's something new. That's something different. You need to revisit the contracts, revisit the trademarks and add that on. There's things like manufacturing contracts. If they're doing this for you, perfect. It's protected by an agreement, NDA, contract. If you then say, oh, actually, you were so good. Could you do this as well? That isn't covered by that contract necessarily. Have another contract, protect yourself. Um, and it does happen. Um, and you are an entrepreneur, you've set up a business, you're doing fantastic, you're scaling, you're getting investment. But you also have to remember, it's got to be achievable and realistic for you. You have a life outside the business, hopefully, or you will again. Um, so don't overstretch yourself because nobody wants a company that's overstretched and not working. And if you have your a full time job elsewhere or if you had too many businesses, you're going to have to convince people, whether it's your staff, whether it's investors, that you can juggle it all, that you can run it all. Have a good ecosystem, have mentors around you, have people around you. Just be really careful as an entrepreneur. It's the biggest failing and strength and weakness of all of us. 
that you want to do everything yourself, that you're brilliant, you're multitasking, but you just have to be really careful that it's doable for you. Um, large institute procurement contracts is what I discussed before. It's so exciting when you get a large bank say, I want your product, here's a contract, deliver me 2,000 units. Fantastic, that's what you're all about. But are you ready? You have to ask yourself, are you ready for this? Because you're going to need extra staff maybe. You're going to have to be ready to go on whatever they're, you're producing. If you don't hit their target, they will push back and they might not pay you until you're ready. And I have seen businesses close that cannot fulfill these contracts. They haven't had contingency plans. So A, are you ready? B, do you understand everything in that contract? But C, make sure that you have your contingency backup plan. Management, you are going to be running, 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 running. And staff can lose motivation if you're not there, if they're just like a powerhouse working and you're not there. It could slow your scale up. So having people to actually make sure the staff understand where they're going, that they're motivated, having people go in. It sounds obvious. It's very difficult when you're in the midst of an investment round or you're in the midst of scaling. So just don't take your eye off the ball when it comes to staff. And really important, I learned this when I first started my business 15 years ago. You have a strength and you will invariably always have a weakness. I am not an accountant. I'm not HR. My IT skills are appalling. And I started doing all that myself, as I'm sure many of you do. My IT skills will turn the computer on and off and hope it works. Eventually, you hire people to do that. You have to understand that there are going to be times where you need to hire people for this. And we all understand when you're scaling, money is tight. But you're just going to have to pick which of the areas you know you can do and which areas you can't. All of this is self-expansion. and It's not done to patronise. But it's just to remind you that this is normal, that we all run, 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 and we forget a lot of the very basics. Being there, done that myself, and it's just nice to remind entrepreneurs that you've done an amazing job, you're going to do an amazing job, just don't drop the eye on all of these sort of things. Um, and that comes back to a support system. Everybody's petrified of a lawyer charging a fortune, not understanding the tax advisor, don't really want to pay for people at the moment, but don't underestimate professionals. So for a tax advisor, Yes, you'll have to pay a bit of money. Yes, they sort out everything for you. However, they will ultimately save you a fortune. If you structure your business efficiently, whether it's an investor coming in, whether it's EIS, SAIS, which is the tax structuring, whether it's entrepreneur's relief, they will ultimately save you money. So if you do nothing else, get some advice, understand that and start looking forward. Obviously, I'm not here to sell at you, but getting legal advice your contracts are robust I can protect you in the future and help you but again just have a free consultation and understand what you might need in the future if not now and also having people like FDs what does a financial director do do you need someone full-time or do you need someone to outsource do you need somebody to help you with the term sheet but that's all do you need somebody in-house full-time doing your technology or can you outsource there's a lot of support and advice out there so many professionals so many free grants, so many free groups. Go onto the forums, read who people trust, read about what resources are available. It can be a minefield. Sometimes there's too much information, but there is a lot out there for businesses now to take advantage of it. And invariably make sure, you know, where you are weak, that's where you need the advice and support on. Don't be afraid to admit that. Look in the mirror, be honest with yourself and take that advice. Um, and ultimately, as you go into this, whether you're a startup or scale up, what's your end game? Because you need to make sure you and the co-founders agree what you want to do. Do you want to exit? Do you want to sell? Do you want to organically grow? You then sell that to the investor and you need to make sure their interests are aligned with you. And you don't want any surprises or disputes. So have that conversation. Then put the tax planning in place. So, you know, make sure that when you receive monies, when you take out monies, it's tax efficient and it's planned. Doing that early on will actually save you money in the future. And when you expand, what kind of money do you need? What kind of business plan will you need? What are your budgets? Forecast in the future, dream about three years and five years, take the investors on board with you, get the founders on board with you and plan for that. And don't forget in the background, your pensions, your wills, your wealth manager, your family. There's a lot to think about. But again, you need to think of all of this in the background. So you're going to be employers, you're going to have shareholding, you're going to be a director of business and you are going to have to think about all these other things as well. So there is a lot to think about as a business owner, but if you do it in a strategic way, hopefully it saves you money, gives you a plan to work on 
and that should help you very much. Some of that is a very basic work. Some of it's very technical. I've covered quite a lot. Very happy to offer a free consultation if any of that is sort of needed by anybody. Happy to give you the slides as a kind of a whistle stop as to what you may or may not need to do at the moment or do. Um, but I'm very happy also to take questions because I appreciate that was quite a lot of um, information.